So you, you just want me to talk? Um, Okay. Um, the piece that I um, that I've made for the Mudam Grand Hall it consists of this uh, uh, huge tower, sort of 15 meters high, in which we've housed the uh, nervous systems inverted, which is a machine I made last year, which is the latest of my uh, rope machines. This one is the first one that's suspended um, above people's heads and operates almost like a mobile, where you have um, everything very balanced, but it uh, it, it sort of uh, rotates very very slowly and through it then pulls down this vertical cone of strings. There's 162 strings that come down and form this focal point here, which then gets pulled along the ground uh, and goes around this winch that's very, um, very turning very, very slowly. Uh, and it's timed to uh, make basically just enough rope during the show. So the spools will run out at the end of the show, so they'll all fall down and will remain on the floor and then the machine will be empty at the end of the show. And uh, you'll have the inside and the interior of the, um, the tower will be filled with rope that you can sort of lie in and uh, sit around in. I mean, originally I've, I've made a few rope machines um, over the years, um, but then they, I guess the early inspiration or the early preoccupations with the machines was they were very interested in the perception of time. And that uh, as a process-led machine, I was interested in this uh, a machine that made rope because rope seemed like a perfect metaphor for time in that it is, uh, it's something that we, um, it's both linear and cyclical. And so it sort of has this property of both being a rotational and a linear structure. Uh, so they sort of, which is both, which is, seems to be very appropriate to the way we sort of conceive of as time as a sort of spiral or as a line. Uh, so I wanted to sort of, it's almost like an actualized metaphor. And so above us is the spools are almost like um, planets, very, very slowly rotating, out of which is pulled, the, extruded out these timelines, which then gather together to form a collective history. Uh, like a ticker tape or uh, and they um, form a timeline which then you can trace any moment in this rope to a certain period in the show. So every moment is a sort of um, represents a, the present at some, per, at some moment in the past. Um, and you have certain mutations and you have certain sort of irregularities in the rope which, which, uh, which represent some irregularity or some fault or some technical or some inconsistency in the machine above or some remote part of one, one particular spool where something occurred. And so everything can be traced back in a sort of archaeological way to a certain moment during the past. And so it's sort of, I guess, and there's sort of a, when that, when that rope coalesces and forms here, it was beginning to form days or weeks before further above. So you have this lag this delay in where the present is, but also in terms of what goes in, the inputs of what we do now are only felt later. So there's a sort of interesting relationship to, to weather and climate or just generally what, when, we, um, when you do something, repercussions are only shown later and really the, where, how you can really um, predict what the repercussions are of one's actions is kind of very difficult. And whether we say with the climate, whether a uh, hundred years ago we're only really feeling the effects of things a hundred years ago, whether it's a thousand years ago, or, and what we do now, where those things really kind of um, become sort of um, materialized is really questionable. Um, but I guess this is quite a nice, this lag is really present in this piece, and so it really sort of exemplifies that sort of model, the, we the sort of model of weather or the, of those sort of chaotic patterns. Um, the tower itself was very much conceived with me and my um, uh, structural engineer uh, called Structure Workshop and we sort of conceived it together as this sort of structure that would house the tower and it has this viewing platform above and uh, st one spiral staircase for ascending and one for descending the tower and it was quite inspired by um, uh, gasometers I guess in England we have these um, things for storing gas that rise and fall and it was um, there's quite a lot of them in London and I guess that was one of the sort of points of inspiration. Um, but it was really a, a, it also a response to this, to the Grand Hall itself, to create a, a sort of piece that would fit in here and that would house this machine. And the, really the only parameter we had was to try and keep this focal point around the floor. And so that was sort of defining the height of the machine. And uh, the rest then sort of came quite naturally from trying to make a, a thing, a, 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 a device that would house this, this machine, but also allow you to see it from, from a kind of high, high level. So before, when we'd shown it in New York, it was, um, you could only see it from below, so it was sort of silhouetted against the sky. 
and uh, it was quite difficult to see all the details and all the complexity of the structure. So this really allows you to, to get close to the machine. Okay, so this piece is called Slow Arc Inside a Cube, and it's the fourth in a series of pieces that um, are very different from the Rope series, but it's um, which explore sort of light and geometry and philosophy. Um, it was in, it was inspired. Um, well basically, it's it's it, the title is very self-descriptive. It's um, it's a basically a light that moves very slowly from one corner of the cage to the other, and it creates a, it, the cage acts as a lens in the room. So any room that you put it in, it, it, it basically creates a sort of um, the room becomes in flux. So it sort of distorts the geometry of the room. So it's quite an architectural piece in that sense. Um, the piece was actually inspired by a quotation from a scientist called Dorothy Hodgkin, who was very active in the 1950s in England, and she um, de, um, she discovered the structure of um, pig insulin by a process called crystal radiography, which is a very long-winded um, process in which you extract from very abstract data, you build up this protein cloud of, um, of, uh, of this three-dimensional cloud of insulin. And she, she, so she built this beautiful three-dimensional model from this very abstract information. But she described the process as like trying to work out the structure of a tree, but by only seeing its shadow. So it was a sort of beautiful Plato's cave kind of analogy. Uh, in which she kind of um, sort of the idea that the sort of shadows are the real, um, but it implied also that we would never, by seeing the shadow of a tree, you would never really ever be able to see that complexity and all the bark and all the twigs and all the leaves, and to see the, that foot, the the true sort of brilliant radiance of that of that reality would never be something that we would ever achieve. So it was kind of quite a sort of it's quite a sad um, kind of analogy in a way, but I guess with this piece I was trying to. Um, if you're putting a platonic object in a room, this, this cube, uh, this third of the platonic objects, and then basically if, you, if we could only see the walls of the room, whether you'd be able to get back to the original shape from, from, just, from just the shadows. And it's, I mean, with such a simple thing you probably could, but it's just, I guess, it sort of has a relationship to cosmology and the whole way we um, have inferred the universe through, blindly through, through just our sort of kind of cleverness, really, and all. But, uh, and math mathematics, but the whole way we see the universe is not through sight and through light, but through other information that we've inferred, this sort of the shape and the, the tapestry of the universe and the, the number of planets and stars and the, the fact that it's expanding, it's all done blindly.